Guard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I have a dream that one day a soldier of peace this nation will rise up a soldier of peace live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream so a soldier of peace. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Nonviolence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and I'm the executive director of the Meta Center for Nonviolence. We study the power of active nonviolence worldwide, and this show explores the same topic from the perspective of activism, uh, activists, teachers, and even scientists. We also get to the news a little bit later in the program. Today, Michael Nagler, my co-host and my news anchor for the Nonviolence Report on this show, interviews Dr. Jude Kurivan, who is a cosmologist, planetary healer, a futurist, author, and she's actually previously one of the most senior businesswomen in the UK, and she's co-founder of something called The Whole World View. Jude holds a PhD in archaeology where she researched ancient cosmologies and she has a master's degree in physics from Oxford where she specialized in cosmology and quantum physics. She's the author of six nonfiction books currently available in 16 languages in 26 countries. Her latest is The Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Center of Creation. And let's tune into her conversation with Michael Negler about cosmology quantum physics, and nonviolence. Let's tune in. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I am very pleased to be uh, interviewing Dr. Jude Kurivan, who is uh, an evolutionary leader and is phoning in today from the UK. She is the author of six books, the latest being The Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Center of Creation, which is going to be one of the things I'd like to talk about. And uh, she is previously one of the most senior businesswomen in the UK, which is, I think, a fascinating and intriguing combination. (laughs) Uh, Jude, you have an MA in physics and a PhD in archaeology. That's already an unusual combination. (laughs) I've been a very scenic route in my life, Michael, as you've just (laughs) described. (laughs) Yes, it reminds me very much of Elizabeth Satouris, who... uh, had had various migrations. And now, I guess for starters, Jude, would you tell us about your book? The latest one, that is, uh, Cosmic Hologram. Why is that important? Well, it's a book that I've really wanted to write since I was four or five years old, because it describes reality, it describes the world in the way that I've experienced it from being a small child, um, where everything is profoundly interconnected and even more than that is ultimately unified um, and so it's remarkable and wonderful in its the unity expressed through its diversity um, and what I've been feeling for a very long time is that our worldviews drive our behaviors and in our societies we generally have a worldview of separation science has told us that our universe is made up of separate things pretty much, even though quantum theory pointed clues out that that wasn't the case. But our general science and all the other things that flow from that describe a world that is separate and therefore ultimately meaningless, Um, that evolution is a series of accidents. Somehow, after a very long time, consciousness somehow has arisen from our brains. but that's wrong. I mean, that's innately, fundamentally wrong, uh, as you know, universal spiritual teachings have, have, have shown us and as indigenous wisdom has always understood. And yet now, um, new discoveries, 
across all scales of existence and numerous, numerous fields of research are providing evidence that turns that old paradigm materialistic separatism on its head and instead shows us that our universe indeed does exist and evolve as a unified entity a beginning not in a big bang which wasn't big and it wasn't a bang it was <laughs> very <laughs> small very small but incredibly ordered and intentional and so space has expanded and time has flowed ever since as a big breath as an out breath um, and everything in existence in this new understanding and this ancient understanding of course is meaningful we have meaning mm. and purpose but the whole of existence has meaning and purpose and what it also shows is that our universe embodies from the very beginning an evolutionary impulse to evolve from simplicity to complexity and finally to really frame this it's showing us that mind and consciousness aren't something we have they're literally what we and the whole world are. Now mm. that for me heals our worldview. It heals our fragmented perspectives that drive our dysfunctional behaviors. And just as conflict is the most natural outcome of a fragmented worldview, a world of separation. So for me, peace is the most natural outcome of this new perspective, this ancient perspective of unified reality and unity expressed in radical and wondrous diversity. That is so wonderful to hear. It's like a much more elegant and much more expert version of things that we've been trying to say at the Meta Center for a long time. The, f the phrase that has occurred to me recently is you, you cannot graft nonviolence onto a materialistic worldview. Yeah, it just, absolutely. It just doesn't fit. C could you Share with us what uh, some of those really telling new discoveries are. Well, I'd be delighted to. First of all, what we're finding is that there are patterns throughout nature, but not just throughout nature, patterns that also play out through our collective behaviors. So from the very smallest patterning of energy and matter to the largest scale, um, of you know, vast clusters of galaxies, there are relational, dynamic, geometrical patterns that can be seen as underpinning the appearance of all systems. But we're finding these patterns called fractals, not just through the natural world at all scales of existence, but throughout our human behavior. So for example, we find that the way that cities grow and the way that galaxies grow have the same patterning. We find that the patterns that underpin ecosystems underpin the relational patterning that we find in the in internet. Yeah. Mm. And we find also that these, the appearance of energy and matter and space and time is arising from these deeper levels of cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness intentionally and meaningfully so that everything we call reality is literally informed meaningful information embodied in people and planets and plants but from the very smallest to the very largest but there are two pieces of evidence that actually were discovered after the book went to press one was cosmological in scale well both were cosmological in scale which means the scale of the whole universe the first is a study of something called the cosmic microwave background and what that is is that when our universe began it was incredibly dense and hot minute but dense and hot but ordered but it was it wasn't therefore transparent to light, but it was transparent to sound. So over the next almost 400,000 years, as our universe was beginning and the energy and, and, and matter that would go on to form stars was coming into being, instead of light flooding the early universe, it was 
it was flooded by sound, by pulses of sound that literally, literally sang our universe into existence. They sang the beginnings of stars, but and planets and all everything that's unfolded since. But after 380,000 years, the universe expanded enough and cooled down enough that it did become transparent to light. And when it did so, that radiation, that light, still exists and it fills the whole of space. But as its space has expanded, that light has moved from being visible light and we actually know it was a sort of orangey colour how cool is that, that we know the colour of the universe? It's amazing. But over time, it, <laughs> it moved from being an orange and it moved into the microwave wavelengths. So it's invisible other than at certain uh, through certain telescopes that measure microwave radiation. And what we find filling the whole of space is exactly the same patterns, fractal patterns, that underpins... Um, underpins everything we see at all scales of existence. And that is the signature of the cosmic hologram. That is the signature of the cosmic hologram that fills the whole of space. But the other thing that, you know, I think is even more mind blowing and heart healing is mm -hmm. that in 2018, um, a team at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT were able to do something that, that quantum theory had predicted but had been sort of discounted for a very long time, which was the whole of our universe exists and evolves as a unified entity that's what's called non-locally interconnected. Now, what that means is that although within space-time there is a, a, a limiting speed limit, the speed of light, which means that you know signals between and within our universe can only go as fast as the speed of light. But the quantum theory predicted that our universe would actually exist and evolve as a unified entity, a non-locally connected entity that knows itself as a wholeness, as well as expressing itself within space-time as diverse and differentiated expressions of itself. So what the MIT team did was they were able to non-locally entangle mm -hmm. photons of light in the laboratory with starlight from 600 light years away. Good with grief. Light, hang on, it gets better. It gets better. With light from what's called a quasar. Now, a quasar is an incredibly active galactic center that formed very, very early on in the universe's history. And the MIT folks managed to entangle light from two quasars, the furthest of which was 12.2 billion light years away with the starlight and the photons in the laboratory. And that is, you know, 12.2 billion light years away is essentially cosmological. We can take that as essentially being the, the wholeness of our universe. So, you know, that actually is able then to help us understand what I call supernormal phenomena, um, such as telepathy and precognition. But also it brings value, huge value and grounding to our intuitive insights, to, it, to synchronicities, to all these phenomena that the old paradigm of science has discounted are now being seen as natural phenomena and natural attributes of what it means to be human. So does this go beyond uh, what I knew as the EPR experiment, Einstein, Podolsky, or Zane? That didn't that yes. also prove that the universe was non-local? Yes, and Einstein hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said there's only room for one joke in there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He called it spooky action at a distance. And he yeah. really, you know, with the, with the new evidence, I absolutely am sure that if he was with us, he would be waving his hands in the air. You know, <laughs> he well, really he, would be. <laughs> he's bound to be with us in some sense. But, uh, you know, he this is. is this is so fascinating. Uh, the Vedic science, of course, always said that the primal emanation of the universe uh, from reality, from 
non-differentiated reality was sound. Not exactly. Right. It was the original arm. And it was. It was the primordial arm. But the arm of our universe lasted 380,000 years. And then it becomes what David Bohm called frozen light. Yes, then it becomes light. Then it becomes light. Exactly so. And of course, as, as you know, Michael, the, the Ishnavaya um, Upanishad, which is one of the key teachings of the ancient Vedic Indian tradition, says that everything is consciousness. What we're able to do now is to show the how of that. How does cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness create, co-create the appearance of the reality of our universe. And, and we're now melding this leading edge science with this ancient understanding. And this is why I feel it's so powerful because science and spirituality are converging and integrating into this unified perspective, this framework, this unifying framework that we can, you can, we can say yes and come together because we, we've never been apart. <laughs> Well, uh, the, uh, there is an article called, and I want to sort of edge our way more toward nonviolence and peace. Now, you, you lay a wonderful groundwork for that when you talk about the unity of the universe. And, of course, twice you've touched on a buzzword here, <laughs> which is appearance. Yeah. The way consciousness becomes the universe that we experience is what the ancients called Maya, which yes. doesn't mean illusion necessarily, but it does mean appearance yes. as opposed to substantial reality. Is, is that approximately what you were getting at when you used that word appearance? Very much so, because um, for me as well, you know, reality is multidimensional. You know, we, we, when we talk about the ground of all being and, and, you know, we're talking about really the infinity and eternity of, of cosmic mind. And so, yes, it, you know, I talk, about our, I talk about our universe and universes being great thoughts of cosmic mind. They're great thoughts rather than great things. So it very much is that Maya, that appearance, but an appearance of a universe that is experiencing and exploring and evolving what unity means by to differentiate. Because of course, in a, you know, in another tradition, the, the ancient Chinese tradition, and the I Ching talks about the one differentiating into the two, the two into the three, and from the three, 10,000 things are born. So this is, this is that perception too. So that when we are practicing nonviolence, we're actually tracing our way back to an original state of being from which we have, as they would say in the Judeo-Christian tradition, from which we have fallen. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally um, prefer not to use the word fallen. Uh, maybe no. we've maybe we've lost our way a little bit or, or <laughs> become misled. But, you know, we are waking up, it seems to me, to literally remember that we are inseparable. I think one of the things with that, though, is the is the emphasis on unity and diversity, because unity is not about uniformity. It's this incredible, gorgeous, wonderful radical diversity of expression but it's exactly it's exactly what you're saying yeah that, it has often seemed to me actually that that uh, inability to grasp that concept of unity and diversity is causing incredible problems uh, tremendous grief it it kind of prevents us from understanding the universe that we're living in and, and the world of living beings that we're living in Absolutely. But one of the things I think that is important is that, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, co-founded something called Whole World View alongside um, launching the book in 2017. And we emphasize that it's not just about understanding this, it's experiencing it and it's embodying it. So, you know, I think that it's incredibly important that this is an invitation to an adventure. 
into a remembered wholeness. But that adventure, it calls us to experience this sense of wholeness. However we do so, it's just that the book's got the the book's got our back. The book's showing us the evidence <laughs> that, it, that, that this isn't a fool's errand, that this is real, that this is the true reality. And then mm. it invites us into the ad- adventure to experience that for ourselves. And when we do that, not only do we wake up, um, we can eventually link up and lift up together. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that is just beautiful. Now, is that not where perhaps meditation fits in? When you talk about experiencing the oneness, that is the end result of a successful meditation journey, is it not? Oh, very much so. I, I find, though, that, that people... F- people can feel into that oneness in different ways. I think it's certainly about an inner practice and a regular inner practice. And certainly meditation is, is a wonderful, a wonderful way. Um, and my sense is m- more often and shorter because there's something about the repetition of, of a practice and inner practice that I personally find very helpful, but also being in nature, actually just being, being with a tree, being with a plant, being with a child, being with a sunset, you know, that sense of oneness, that sense of, for me, what what this is all about is the science of love. (laughs) (laughs) So how we experience love, you know, with all the the sort of the, 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 the trauma that, you know, a sense of fragmented love causes, Mm. but an experience of unity love, then whatever that may be can open up the whole world literally to us. Well, we often say that nonviolence is love in action. So understanding would be one dimension, but people can also practice nonviolence, experience its effectiveness, experience how deeply grounded and wonderful it makes them feel, without necessarily understanding the theory behind it. But the theory certainly helps. It does, and I agree with you. I I agree with you. And the book wasn't written for those folks. Mm -hmm. Um, It was written for the folks that say, show me the evidence. Yeah. I might meditate if I thought it was helpful, but show me the evidence. I might, you know, be able to, to, you know, accept the invitation to this adventure if I if I can trust that it's real, so th- it was for those folks that say, "Well, science says." Well, yeah. so, th- the old paradigm of science is fundamentally flawed, and this, by the way, expands that science. I revere the pioneers of quantum physics and, and Albert Einstein and many others. You know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. So, but what this does is is expands that twentieth century science, um, and it. it absolutely frames it in terms of consciousness and 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 unity. And and thus, if I'm not mistaken, see if you agree with me, thus it uh, it brings it into living reality and every compartment of our life, not just an intellectual exercise. Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, we (laughs) we spent a few years enjoying playing with words on this, but we'd say it's about thinking cosmic feeling global, acting local. So it's all about head, heart, and hands. <laughs> yeah. Body, mind, and spirit. Well, yeah. if, you, if you go back, Jude, to the days of, uh, you know, Norbert Wiener, I think, who kind of launched information theory, and, and then we had the global uh, uh, environmental, the general environmental research group, uh, with, um, oh, you would know probably better than I some of the people who were involved in that. Uh, do you see, here's the important point, do you see a growing acceptance of these ideas in any or all fields that you interact with? I do. I do. And and I'm part of a, a group called the um, Spirituality and Education Alliance UK. And that's a, a large number of organizations um, who are looking to um, bring a, a, a holistic worldview into, uh, into education. And the, the, the whole worldview is their unifying framework. It's essential unity. 
essential unity yeah. is the framework for what we're doing together. And I'm, so I'm working in communities of transformational leadership, where this mm. is becoming the unifying framework, transformation education, where it's becoming the unifying framework, um, transformation social, you know, social and cultural and, and transformation every level, because, of course, the old material separatist worldview drove so siloed approach yeah. to you know to whatever and and this obviously um offers a holistic framework within every with within which everything interweaves and can be optimized in that sense um including we really early on but there's an initiative that i'm working with with my friends and colleagues at the evolutionary leader circle and beyond which is offering a unifying framework for the consideration of the sustainable development goals of the united nations and recognizing that they too whilst their responses to our dysfunctional behaviors of themselves can only moderate those symptoms unless we adopt a unified holistic framework as a worldview within which the SDGs can then have a natural flow, just as peace and nonviolence naturally flows from this perspective. That that is just wonderful to hear. You know, uh, Henry Stapp uh, here at uh, UC Berkeley, a colleague of mine, and oh, it was like thirty or so years ago that he was saying these new discoveries in quantum theory and EPR and so forth are bound to produce uh, a different worldview, an entirely healthier society. And for a long time, it looked as if, uh, yeah, they should, <laughs> but it wasn't working. And now what you're telling us is, and I'm so glad to hear it, that this is starting to catch on. Yeah, very much. And and to be honest, quantum theory of itself was unable to to actually take this next step because Quantum theory, which describes energy matter, and relativity theory, which describes space-time, are really of themselves apparently incompatible. But when you take the next step, and this is always the case, isn't it? You take the next step in a journey and you see how they can be reconciled. And the reconciliation comes through, uh, and I won't go into it because I'd go full science nerd, but it actually um, shows that when you restate the two laws of thermodynamics as two laws of in formation, mm. then quantum theory and relativity theory drop out as expressions of the first and second laws of in formation, and they're naturally reconciled. They're just they're complementary expressions energy matter space time are complementary expressions of in formation i keep halting between the in and the formation yeah. because i want to stress it's meaningful everything is meaningful mm. in formation mm. what i i think what we need are, are more people who would grasp the fundamentals like myself i am innocent of mathematics and, and <laughs> I came from a scientific family, but I'm non-scientific myself. But I do grasp these basics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've been trying to work on is the adaptation, if you will, mm -hmm. of these basic ideas into our social life and our social behavior. And it has often seemed to me that a connecting link is the question of evolution and animal behavior and how cooperation played a much greater role in it than we used to allow in the old paradigm. Uh, is that something that you've dipped a toe into at all? I'm more than dipping a toe. I'm swimming in it at the moment. Um, <laughs> the, the reason being is that I, I, I've always seen um, a trilogy of books that I call the Transformation Trilogy, and the Cosmic Hologram was the first. And so it's about understanding this, this model, this, this unified model. But um, the second book, which I'm writing now, or it's writing me, is called Gaia, Gaia, Her Story. And it continues from where the cosmic hologram ended mm. in its perspective of a living, sentient, evolving universe uh, and Gaia as a, a sentient Gaia sphere, and we are all Gaians in that regard, um, and a universe that literally embodies an innate impulse to evolve from simplicity to complexity and ever greater levels of individuated self-awareness. 
And then the third book? Men, many Voices, One Heart. Ah, I see. Well, uh, I have been uh, arguing that we have two communities of interest of practice that are operating in this, one of the, each in their silo, to use the word that you just used. And one is the New Story People, of which you are a brilliant example. And the other is the nonviolence folks who also have a, a gut feeling that nonviolence works, but they don't know the background to it. And so one of the most useful things we can do, I think, is to try to bring those two communities into a single discourse. I wholeheartedly agree. I was actually in New York uh, many times, but um, mm -hmm. I think it was the last time I was in New York, I co-facilitated a workshop with a dear friend and colleague of mine, Rick Ulfick, um, oh, of I We think. The World. You know Rick? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. and well, Rick and I, great. Well, we also worked together on 11 Days of Global Unity this past September, and he I... invited me to write 11 Pulses, for those uh, 11 days, and so I, I did. And of course, three of those days were around Peace Weekend, which was all about freedom, disarmament, and peace. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, uh, Jude, I really needed some good news this morning, <laughs> and, and you were it. Uh, this is wonderful. We, we have just about come to the end of our time, but I can't uh, leave without, on the one hand, thanking you very much, and on the other hand, asking if we might do this again. Oh, be delighted to, and thank you so much for inviting me. This feels the time, Michael, doesn't it? I mean, this yeah. year, we have found, working globally with many organizations, we had World Unity Week in June. Mm -hmm. We've had Ubiquity University and Jim Garrison launch Humanity Rising. Mm. Where we're, we're sharing the whole world view, we've with Rick's. Where so many of us are now literally linking up and lifting up together, and and I reckon in 2021, I'd like to take two more steps that we level up together and mm. light up together. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I will be huffing and puffing at your footsteps when that happens. Trying to <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It's me puffing and puffing at yours and all the amazing work that you and, and your community do. And I'd love us to continue this conversation and exploration and just see how we can really, you know, share this as widely as possible for the benefit of as many folks as possible and for healing our relationships, not just with each other, but with our planetary home, our beloved Gaia and all her children. My conviction is, Drew, that we have to do this in words and action. Our yeah, words have to be clear and compelling, and our actions have to be consistent with them. And as Gandhi showed, when you when you have that magical formula, uh, it does gain a quant qualitatively different power. Yeah. So. Very much so. You were just listening to an interview between Jude Kurivan, who's a cosmologist, futurist. She has a, done extensive research into ancient cosmologies and quantum physics in peace and conflict studies. And Michael Nigler, my co-host here on Nonviolence Radio, also the president of the Meta Center for Nonviolence. Let's tune in now to the Nonviolence Report with Michael Negler, with special thanks to Julia White for researching information presented in this segment. Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Negler, and I'm bringing you this week's episode of the Nonviolence Report. We're going to be doing, first of all, some news and then some resources and end up with a word or two about meta. So uh, let's start with some activists going on in France. They have been protesting a security bill that was passed last week, and uh, protests are going on because they're demanding the eliminations of certain articles, which would make it uh, almost impossible for uh, protesters or demonstrators to, for example, take films of police actions during their 
protests. Uh, now, here and elsewhere, that is here in the U.S. and elsewhere, there is an international protest against Amazon, the company, that was launched on Black Friday. Uh, it's because of the work conditions of employees, and, and many of them have actually contracted COVID at their work. They also are aiming to have Amazon commit to zero emissions by 2030. So it's uh, partly to protect their own health and well-being and partly to get the company moving in a better direction for all of us. And I think that's a really good combination for uh, protests, demonstrations, other nonviolent actions to undertake. So looking to our northern neighbor, uh, we have once again uh, a news about an indigenous owned solar farm. You know, remember we were talking about indigenous ownership uh, by a company that the um, Mi'kmaq have uh, opened up, have started. So this is an indigenous-owned solar farm, northern Alberta. The community there is Chippewan. The solar farm, they plan to produce 25% of the energy needed for three indigenous communities. Quote, we worked together and we made it happen, said Chief Alan Adam of the Athabascan Chippewayan First Nations. He further said, we work with the sun, we work with the wind, we work with Mother Nature, and we work with the water for the children of the future to give them a better, cleaner life. Unquote. Other Canadian Indigenous news. The Wet'suwet'en standoff continues, and I'm afraid a lot of the events that I'm going to be reporting on today uh, are precisely about standoffs that are continuing. So uh, the Wet'suwet'en have been calling now for international solidarity, and this is partly a, a familiar wrinkle. The background here is the Coastal Gas Link. That's the name of the company, Coastal Gas Link. They have actually now called in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to try and remove the community members and the indigenous youth as they hold a ceremony at the proposed drill site for Coastal Gas Link's pipeline. The wrinkle that I was referring to is holding a religious ceremony, uh, which has been very successful, for example, by Thai Buddhists in years gone by, who made shrines and sacred objects out of certain trees to protect them from being cut down. Now, here, there is another wrinkle that it's the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who have full jurisdiction over these lands. So the Coastal Gas Link is actually trespassing, is actually breaking the law. Quote, as CGL continues to trespass, we will do everything in our power to protect our waters and to uphold our laws. Sometimes you need nonviolence to uphold the laws, as in fact, nonviolence always upholds the higher law. But sometimes you need it to actually uphold human laws. So moving on to a couple of economic items here, uh, Pope Francis uh, has now recently invited young economists from around the world to join him in an event called the economy of Francesco, Francesco being, of course, the original Italian name of uh, St. Francis and the Pope. So they discussed creating a global human-centered economic system. Remember way back to the book uh, Economics as Though People Mattered, which is kind of a launching pad for this whole movement. But here, more than 2,000 economists and entrepreneurs from around the world joined. They emerged with a 12-point proposal for a way forward that will move us away from greed and death towards life and dignity for all, unquote. I'll have occasion in a little bit to mention one of the Pope's statements in a recent letter. But to learn more about this issue, the all-important issue of economics, there's now a very good resource called 
itsoureconomy.us. That's one word, itsoureconomy.us. So we've been following events in Nigeria where once again uh, protesters have been met with brutal repression. This time the cause of the repression is something called the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, S-A-R-S. And uh, there are now threats of the Nigerian army stepping in and uh, I hadn't thought for many years, though, about another struggle in Nigeria, the Ogoni struggle. And now there is a book by a woman, Dumale Dubi Keys, who has uh, published a prize-winning dissertation now entitled For the Survival of Ogoni People, Women's Contribution to Movement Building in Nigeria and the United States. So the prize committee noted the uh, competence of this book, rich ethnographic and historical detail, and said that this book uh, will be a significant resource in women and gender studies, quote, by focusing on the transnational dimensions of black women's organizing and contributions African women specifically make to our global political landscape, unquote. And that is a really helpful development. Now, a bit of background here at uh, the Ogoni struggle really began in the 70s after oil was discovered in their part of Nigeria back in 1958. And you may remember the, the figure Ken Sarowiwa, who wrote, the Ogoni have been gradually ground to dust by the combined effort of the multinational oil company, Shell Petroleum Development Company, with the murderous ethnic majority in Nigeria and the country's brutal dictatorship. So they were really up against a lot. And of course, Sarawiwa himself was executed three years after that statement, which was 1992, uh, by a, a military regime. And for that matter, protests are still going on in the streets of Louisville four months after Breonna Taylor was killed by police in that city. And we, as mentioned before, they're continuing in Thailand and Belarus. It's just this saga we seem to be facing now of nonviolent, at least non-violent insurrection, I'll tell you why I use that term in a minute, and brutal repression. So I'm calling it non-violent because what we're seeing in Belarus is a mixed bag, and I'm getting this information from the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. And in their struggle against a rather brutal regime in Belarus, the people have resorted to various creative actions that help engage other people in mass non-cooperation and disobedience against the regime so far so good, but also to mock its ruler and to peel off key regime supporters. So we have two perfectly legitimate <laughs> nonviolent efforts, mass non-cooperation, disobedience, uh, that's one, and the other is to peel off key regime supporters, that's known as taking away the pillars of support, Made, idea made famous by Gene Sharp. But mocking a person is a no-no in real, or I guess I should call it, principled nonviolence. And there have been episodes of that. I haven't mentioned it before. But once again, you find a movement not really being able to discriminate between what is correct and what is incorrect nonviolence. So there's now a, a book by one Steve Crawshaw called Street Spirit, colon, The Power of Protest and Mischief. And that book looks at what the history of nonviolence has done in the immediate region, that is, uh, of Belarus, and worldwide. So we are moving on now to resources. I always seem to start off, or at least include, talking about unarmed civilian peacekeeping. We now have a list of UCP organizations that are 
have been active throughout the world since 1990. That, that work is done by Selkirk Canada database. It's called unarmed-civilian-peacekeeping-database. And now our own Stephanie Van Hook is busy compiling a more updated and complete list for the Shanti Sena network here in the States. The Mindsight Institute will be hosting talks called Personal Exploration of Planetary Possibility. That will be every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And they're focusing on using the science of the mind and the practice of presence to create a world of compassion and kindness. So if I could comment on that, I do believe that spiritual exercises themselves have a direct effect on the environment, uh, that is the social human environment. But it isn't easy for just anyone to really make that effect potent. So this is something maybe we should talk about further on another time. But meanwhile, there will also be on December 9th, a Zoom discussion with Larissa Rhodes. Now she's the woman who produced the Social Dilemma film. And that will be on what we can do to keep digital media from interfering with the healthy development of children. So that discussion is, is titled, Campaign for a, a Commercial-Free Childhood. That's very helpful, of course, given the harmful role of commercial in disorienting us to materialism. And did not Pope Francis just say in his letter to the New York Times, quote, feverish consumerism breaks the bonds of belonging, unquote. But I think we have to go further and help our children also stay free from the two V's, violence and vulgarity. Might mention that Alicia Garza, who co-founded and gave the name to the Black Lives Matter movement, she also has a new book out where she distills the lessons she learned from BLM and uh, actually from a decade of community organizing. This is Alicia's first book. It's called The Purpose of Power, colon, How to Build Movements for the 21st Century. So that is information we need to have. Now, as for the Meta Center, our film, The Third Harmony, continues to get accolades wherever people see it, and it will be shown at the Camera as Witness Program's Power of Empathy series, which is being co-presented with the Palo Alto Libraries and the Stanford Film Society on Human Rights Day, December 10th, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific. Our board game Cosmic Peace Force is also shipping now, and Giving Tuesday we launched some special offers, which you can learn about at metacenter.org slash get dash involved slash donate. And finally, folks, we are moving to a nicer office here in the same building, and we hope that we can actually get to use it when the pandemic is over. So with many thanks to our mother station, KWMR, and to our redoubtable team, Matt Watrous and Julia White, glad you could listen, and we will meet you again with the next episode of the Nonviolence Report. disease but then I sense we are fine it'll all happen one small step at a time when the world is full of violence and it needs a little kindness I just sit and pray in silence and God shows me the signs open my eyes realize we are fine one small act at a time. Last night I'm walking home and the homeless man says hello with a smile to let me know that he's got a lot of hope. He says, have faith, young man. We are fine. The world is kind. One small act.
act at a time. Small acts we do together, even though maybe alone changes the world for the better, so we can call it home. And this is life as we know when our hearts are aligned. The magic that unfolds one small act at a time. Throw your hearts up, let it fly. Today, never thought this day would come where I would feel it and say that each and every one of us has paved the way doing good, and now we're all just moving up. When I'm kind to you, you pay it forward. This is how we yeah. build trust. Never had faith, but now I'm seeing you. I, t- I want a gift in my life, want to spread love before I die. Thank you, God, for finally letting me realize when I serve man, I'm really serving you in disguise. Smiles everywhere, cause now everybody's got the bug ain't no life without the love if it is it ain't no fun what we gonna do now just grab a friend and give a hug spread it out real wide so everyone can be touched throw your hearts up let it fly high let your love for all the world spread through the sky let it drop down let it all go spreading kindness to every single Time and kindness will be all we can be.